Okay, welcome back to another Sam.gov Bids Live episode where we walk through small business solicitations together on Sam.gov and we answer questions along the way, your questions, so that you can start bidding and winning contracts for your business. Okay, today we actually have six, count them six, small business solicitations pulled up that we're going to be jumping into today in just a second. But if you are new here and you don't want to miss future Sam.gov bids episodes, consider subscribing to the channel and then also clicking that notification bell so that you can answer and so that you can, <laughs> it's been a minute guys, so that you can ask your questions and I can answer your questions live on future streams. Uh, we'll get there. It's so good to be back. It's been about a week and a half. Um, but if you are and happen to be somebody who's recently registered in Sam and you are looking to get started bidding, and maybe that's why you're here, um, feel free to check out my website, govkidmethod.com. We do have free and paid resources there that were designed specifically to help small business owners just like you. So we'll go ahead and just check in really quickly and I will share my screen and we'll just touch on the bids that we're going to be covering today. And then we'll kind of launch into it. Like I said, bear with me here as we kind of, it's been a minute, get teed back in here. So the first bit we're going to be reviewing today is our uh, DFAC attendant services. Okay, sounds like staffing. Number two, janitorial services out of Fredericksburg, Virginia. Document shredding, it's going to be for the Army. Electronic security services. We also have Minot Air Force Base grounds maintenance. And then if we have time, um, I'm going to continue since we're in the season, as I see them, uh, pulling snow and ice removal contracts as well. And just so you know, if this is your first, you know, live or you're just kind of jumping in here and you're not sure how these work with the bids and with the live, this is obviously totally live. And the way it works is we go one bit at a time. Um, I have not reviewed these in advance. This way I go through them raw and in real time for the first time with you so that if things are able to like be messy or don't make sense, um, you get to see that because that's exactly what you're gonna be going through when you're doing this on your own. So I don't wanna give you like the polished edited versions of things, that's why I like doing these live. Um, and like I said, I don't go through them. And then uh, in between bids, what we do is we answer questions in the chat. So you have also an opportunity to post questions in the chat and then you'll see that I will bounce between bids and questions and we'll basically do that for about an hour and we will have a grand old time. So if you are here live, good morning, good afternoon for some. Let me know where you're from. What state are you located in? Let me know that you're alive and let's go ahead and dive into our first contract for DFAC attendant services. So this is for the Army. This is a USPFO. Um, looks like Indiana National Guard. Small business set aside. This, they're actually classifying this now as a janitorial NICS code. At a glance, you know, attendant services, this could be a few things, but this could also be, you know, like staffing or they're saying a form of janitorial. So we're not 100% sure. These are the things that we look for. Uh, again, Fort Wayne, Indiana. Giving us a bit of information in the listing description here but it's all boilerplate stuff and we will kind of refer to our attachments. So we do have a Q&A doc, it appears, um, solicitation document and then an actual performance of work statement, PWS. So we do have these three attachments that we will be plowing through. Um, we do have Master Sergeant Lisa Krause and Travis uh, Craig in contracting with the contracting office address being listed um, here as well. So not always guys, just kind of like a, a little tip for you. Sometimes the contracting address will match okay, the, the place of performance where the work's to actually be done. So sometimes this is indicative. Other times it's not. Sometimes contracting can be on the whole other side of the country and they are soliciting procurements for, you know, even a different, different, you know, agencies. Sometimes we do see a little bit of mixing there, um, but certainly other locations. So sometimes this is helpful to think of it that way. Other times it's not just a little like side tip, something to keep in mind. So let's go ahead and take a look at our attachments. I always like to dive in with the solicitation doc first. And since this is 
my show. That's what we're going to do today. And it's typically what we always do. So this is 43 pages and kind of always like to just see what we're getting into. It's kind of an art and a science. So we do see a wage determination on the back end that's taking up really like the last 10 to 12 pages easing into our reps and certs. So you can quickly see like we're already halfway through the document, more than halfway. Um, and we're kind of getting through the the regulations and the, the legal jargon and the wage determination. The, the PWS is actually attached separately. So we're not even looking to find that here, which is why almost the entire solicitation is regulations, reps and certs. Now we're into the reps and certs. Um, so we're probably just gonna be hit with like pricing cleans that we, <laughs> we saw on the first page. And, and that's, that's it. Um, so we will take a glance. They're saying KP services. So we're going to find out a little bit about the period of performance here beginning one November. So this is, I mean, actually supposed to start in how many days? Today's the 26th. So one, two, three, four, next Monday, uh, or actually next Tuesday. So less than a week. And when was this due again? Okay. This is actually due today. So this would be more of a practical example rather than something you're probably going to run out and try to actually bid on. We usually get a mix. But with that being said, it's very likely if some of you are like, oh my gosh, like this is due in two days and then they want the work to start the next day. I don't know if I'm going to be ready. Hey, listen, don't worry. It's very unlikely and it's much more common that contracting pushes back the actual start date. We see that so often. I understand and it's great to be ready and, and you should, but contracting wants you to succeed unless it's a certain project where there can be absolutely no overlap or no gap in service. And you see that definitely like in much larger contracts. Um, but with these small business contracts, often underneath the simplified acquisition threshold, what we find is like, they may be on vacation for a week and they're like, Oh yeah, we're going to put this contract into place. Like when I get back and that's going to be, you know, like November 11th or something. So we don't, sweat it too much, but we do everything to be prepared when we do have those close start dates that are not too far off from the actual um, pr proposal due date. Okay. Like short gap there. So looking at this, we are seeing base plus four option years. So five year contract, which is great. We don't have a whole lot of information on these cleanse other than KP services. And again, looking at you know, they're calling this attendance services. What does K mean, KP mean? Um, that hasn't even been, I guess, laid out to us yet. So since we have limited information, we may kind of do some bouncing around. I'm going to bounce over to the PWS and maybe this will help to fill in those gaps. Where did it go? Here we go. All right. So how many pages is our PWS? And this is, this is like what this process is going to be like for you. This is why we do it live. This is only seven pages. Statement of works are usually not overly intensive with page count, but they do give you the kind of the meat and potatoes, the nitty gritty of the actual work to be performed. So I'm trying to understand what is KP services like specifically. So they're saying the required services include, but are not limited to main dining hall and pots and pans area, orderly dining hall, kitchen oversight, dishwashing room, windows, floor maintenance. Okay. This really is sounding more about like, like janitorial, um, housekeeping maintenance as was indicated in the NAICS code, but wasn't really indicated in the, the title. So clean pots and pans. Okay. Clean sanitize. Keep the dining and kitchen area cleaned during prep and serving time. Uh, looks like garbage disposal, milk containers, dishwashing room, replenishment of dinnerware. Okay, so more, more dishes and trays. But then they're talking about windows and floors. Okay, cleaning the windows. Um, and then wet mopping, sweeping the floor. So I think we get a pretty good idea. You know, spot cleaning, drains in the kitchen, mopping. They do repeat the uh, repeat rather the pricing cleanse here, and they are also giving us a bit more information, saying twenty four total days of service. Now, did they tell us that in the solicitation? 
They did. So they did tell us 24 total days of service. And so that's going to be basically a Monday through Friday plus a Saturday, right? So if you have six day weeks on average, Sunday's off. I don't know if that's the actual schedule, but it would work out to be 24 days of service if you're doing six day weeks. And it may be like a Monday through Saturday thing. That would be pretty common sense. So I always say this is kind of like putting together a puzzle and we, we, um, where we go, there we go. We kind of put the pieces together as we can. And sometimes we have to move a few pieces, but we put them in an order of a story that makes sense. Because then if you are using a subcontractor, you're trying to do like a legal middleman thing or something like that, uh, then you're able to communicate properly with subcontractors and just for your own pricing, like you need to know what's going on to price this accurately. Information is information accuracy rather is the most important thing when it comes to pricing. And then number two, I would say is your actual pricing strategy, because it's good to like price accurately, but you also need to price competitively. All right. So we only had one other document. And thing is too, guys, they, they're not telling us anything in terms of like instruction to offers, evaluation factors. We only have pricing cleanse only to fill out pricing on. They are calling this a quote, but there's like, I'll do a quick, you know, kind of control F. I went through it extremely quickly, but I did not see anything of the like. Valuation in terms of asking for resumes, past performance, um, anything like management plans, staffing plans to back up, um, just not here. Okay. So this is going to be heavily quote priced, or I should say solely quote priced based off of these pricing cleans that they're giving us. All right. So let's go ahead and bounce on over here to the chat. Let me get this cleaned up, close these out. All right. Perfect. All right, guys. Yes, we are live in the chat. Let's go. We got Ashala Bickham. Good morning, California. Love to see it. Bryce Allard out of Minneapolis area. Very cool. Um, Lydia Smith in Florida, not too far from me, perhaps. I'm about 30 minutes from Pensacola. A Kings 14 we got in Atlanta. I'm seeking a contract as an IT recruiter. Awesome. Um, Paris Taylor says, I'm glad I caught my first live. Yeah. There we go, Paris Taylor. Um, Sunny saying... Uh, KP stands for kitchen police. All right. Kitchen police, um, cleaning crew, and cook assistants. There we go. Thank you for the assist on that, Sonny. And we also have Imperfect Fits. Uh, hey, I finally made it to my first live. Let's go. We got a number of people joining us for our first lives. So awesome. And thank you guys for being here. It's it's so much fun, uh, so much fun doing these things. But if you do have questions, I'm, I'm happy to answer those. Um, try and keep them within an answerable amount of context. Um, and let's go ahead and move on to our next solicitation. Now, this one, I didn't, I thought that first one was going to be more professional, like service slash staffing. Um, I didn't know it was going to be more janitorial. So I guess we're going to do two janitorial in a row. I do try and spread them out and get as much like diversity in there as possible. But it does happen. Well, Hasn't really happened too much, but I guess it could happen from time to time. So this is straight up janitorial for USDA, Fredericksburg, Virginia, due November 14th. So this is a live bid. Um, this actually is SDVOSB. So this is small business set aside, but it's for service disabled veteran owned small businesses only. Okay. So they're using that 561720 janitorial um, NAICS code as well. They are saying simplified acquisition, which does anybody know? Like, let's. Let's make this fun. Does anybody know what the simplified acquisition? If you know it, it's a very easy question, but a lot of you probably don't know what what it is. So let's see, who is the first person? I don't have a prize for you today, but who is the first person that I can put in the chat? What is the current simplified acquisition threshold? Okay, it's a number. So whoever's the, who's a, whoever is the first one to put the right number will win um, a, a virtual high five from me. And then for extra credit, extra bonus points, if anybody knows what the previous, because it was changed, um, what was the previous simplified acquisition threshold? And if you're a former contracting officer, existing um, contracting procurement, no cheating, um, <laughs> no cheating, guys. Uh, all right, man, you guys, all right. You guys are a little bit, you guys are on your game. 
So uh, Bob says 150. Wasn't it 250 during COVID? So Bob, I believe it's actually it's still 250. Um, so it kind of answered both questions. Kill two birds with one stone. Um, Chantrice, yep, 250K. That's correct. Austin, 250, nailed it. Um, Zilla D, uh, you're probably talking about the micro purchase threshold. So um, we'll still give you credit for that if you're talking about micro purchases. So yeah, it's currently 250, and then um, it was previously 150. I don't believe they ever moved it back down to 150. Um, so yeah, we're still at 250. So nice job, nice job, guys, nice job. And for those of you who don't know what that is, what it means is contracting is able to use simplified acquisition procedures. Basically, if you read the the, the FAR, the Federal Acquisition Regulations. It, it allows contracting officers to work in an efficient manner to procure goods and services for the government. And that efficient manner is more of a streamlined approach than contracts that are above simplified acquisition, acquisition threshold, unless there's some sort of um, uh, exception that is also, that will also do sometimes. Um, but it's, it's a streamlined and efficient process as opposed to uh, a more lengthy and therefore a more costly process. For example, like, you know, we don't know what it costs contracting to like solicit a bid, but if it's like 10 to 20 K and the contracts for, you know, 75 grand, does that really make sense to invest that much on procuring out, you know, the manpower and all these things to put this together, evaluate offers and all this, um, or can we use a simplified procedure that's going to be more streamlined and save uh, government money, Really, it's saving taxpayers dollars is what it's supposed to be. Um, so hopefully that makes sense. And then there's those dollar limits that allow that to happen. So anyways, since we already did janitorial, I thought I would just kind of ex expound on that a little bit. So they're going to award a one firm fixed price contract to this base with four option years, again, starting January 1st. Okay. So a little bit of time to get, to get in gear here. And max will go uh, out to 2027. So the max, um, and there is an optional to extend, very common six month extension as well. That would push the max out to June, 2028 instead of uh, 2027 year end. They are giving us, this is helpful area one and area two for the places, places meaning more than one. So place number one, uh, they actually both look like they're in Fredericksburg, Virginia, but number one is gonna be sweet, the heck. I'm trying to find, I'm trying to find it. Uh, yeah, it's going to be two different areas. Yeah. One area is 14,953 square feet. Another area is 4,792 square feet. Okay. So one is the offices in the common areas. Then the other is a classroom with a lab um, and walk-in cold storage area. And that's why that's a lot smaller. So they need janitorial services. Okay. It's going to be at the same. That's why I was looking at the address, kind of scratching my head. But it's going to be um, same area in Fredericksburg here at the uh, SCI division. But these two areas inside of the building, if that makes sense. So in terms of documents, we have PWS. We have a wage termination. We have quote sheet, which is an Excel document. Perfect. Um, vendor experience sheet. So you know, alluding to some sort of past experience slash past performance being requested. We do have the solicitation doc, and then we have an amendment to that solicitation doc. And those are our attachments. So I'm going to go ahead and start with the solicitation doc itself. Actually, I'm going to look at the amendment first, and then I'll back into the solicitation doc. And if you guys don't know, here's another tip side golden nugget. Anytime you have an actual amendments, you have to formally acknowledge those. In order to formally acknowledge those, you have to print, date, and sign the amendment just like you would the actual SF-1449 form from the original solicitation. So this amendment's only two pages. Okay, that's why it's different. And they put the, the change in here. So the purpose of this amendment is to include the um, 1449 form attachment vendor quote sheet and vendor experience sheet. And they're saying their due date remains unchanged. Okay, but you have to print, sign, and date, and then also do this little box eight here. Okay, so you would attach this as a separate attachment in your email um, with the submission of your offer to contracting, which who, by the way, who is contracting? Matthew Phillips at USDA.gov. Matthew Phillips three at USDA.gov. Okay, so that's how we handle amendments. And they're just letting us know like, hey, okay, these two sheets were probably not included originally, so now they are. Let us know that you see that by 
uh, acknowledging this amendment. So I'll close that out and we'll just jump over to the actual solicitation document itself. All right, now this, a little shocking, it's actually only eight pages. So remember, this is janitorial in those two areas, the, the 15,000 square feet, and then like the almost 5,000 square feet. They're repeating the period of performance. They're saying uh, service will be, trying to see it rolls over, three days per week, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, when classes are not in session. And then when it is in session, it's five days per week. And then they're basically giving us our, our pricing cleanse here, base year, option year one. And it, this is going to be the whole thing. So they've really broken this out. So I'm going to have to check out the PWS next since that is not attached, just like the previous bid that we looked at. All right. So this, the PWS is actually lengthy, 50 pages. I did see some highlights. This is very strange, okay? You don't typically see contracting putting the solicitation information inside of the PWS, just because this is more than a PWS. They've got CLINs, like this is the actual solicitation, but they're calling it solicitation and PWS. This is why I like to show you this with you guys live because every bid is different. The way contracting and contracting offices put their bids together, it changes. But if you know the fundamentals, if you know the things that uh, we teach that overlap from bid to bid to bid, these things are always the same, then you have the skills and the know-how to go out in the world and go through these yourself because you're going to be looking at bids that are not exactly the same that I'm pulling up. And from week to week, from you know live session to live session, the bids we see, they're always different. And that's why I like to do them off the cuff. So they are highlighting us uh, here for us, just reminding us this is 100% SDVOSB. If you are not, do not waste your time. Highlighting the period of performance, which is very nice. Cleaning schedule. Okay, what do we got here? So evaluation. Okay, this is super important. Here's the instruction to offers and evaluation factors that I was looking for on the last bid that did not exist. They are giving us some bullets here. So the government will award a contract resulting from the solicitation that is most advantageous. And that's with price and other factors considered. The following factors will be evaluated. Number one, cleaning schedule shall not exceed two pages in length. It must be specific to these requirements. So that you need to have a cleaning schedule in your proposal. You know, what is evaluation factors? It's how the winning bidder will be chosen. How do we write proposals to government solicitations? We never start with a blank sheet of paper. Instead, we look and see how we're going to be graded. And then we basically copy and paste that into a, a blank document to form a skeleton. And then you write to those sections and you fill that out. You write out the meat or you, if you've got some proposal builder docs or something like that, resumes, plans, you plug and chug all that stuff in. Then you put in pricing tables. And so we assemble it like that way uh, by working backwards from what the government is asking for. You never like do a, a copy and paste of the statement of work. That's not what I mean by copy and paste. What I mean is you copy exactly what they're asking for so that you know that you're writing to something exactly that they're asking for instead of putting things in like fluff. Or, you know, when we're tempted by the, the blinking cursor of death, right, when we're staring at a blank sheet of paper, I don't know what to write. We can, you know, start out by like writing our company's history. And like, if you're brand new to this, like, they don't care about that. You know, they're, they're looking to grade and rate you and to put you in a pile that's either compliant or not. So this is why we kind of work backwards from the requirements. Um, so in, in addition to that cleaning schedule, QCP, so they want a quality control plan. Not to exceed, again, guys, two pages in length. Why do I talk about not including fluff? Because they don't want it, okay? They want this short, they want this concise. If they can't find it to them, it's not there. Even if you put your past performance in there, even if you have your quality control plan in there, um, if they can't find it, they can't rate it. And if they can't rate it, you will not be technically acceptable and you will be put in the bad pile. You don't wanna do this. So one way of writing competitive offers and putting together competitive proposal responses is not like, having this great grand thing that maybe you paid a proposal writer two grand to write for you because the 
the good stuff could be lost in the mix. So instead, we operate as small business teams of one, two, and three. Less is more. Get to the point. Make it easy to find. Make it easy for them to check the box and say, okay, got it. That's why I say don't put the fluff in there. Experience. The vendor must submit a minimum of two, but no more than five. Separate projects within the last five years. And by the way, you can use a subcontractor's past performance. Now, here's experience and past performance. Wait, Derek, I thought you just, what you just said was past performance. And it's not my fault, uh, but I'm certainly guilty of it. And it's just because it's how the space works. What's the difference between experience and past performance? Okay, past performance. Uh, well, let me say experience is work that you've done. Past performance is how well you've done on that work. So experience could be, we did this job, we did this job, we did this job. And then, but the past performance piece is, okay, how did you do on that job? How did you do on that job? How did you do on that job? So sometimes they will just say, give us your past performance. And you kind of include all of that for each project, if that's all they're asking for. But if they are breaking out and segregating, making a difference between the two, that's how you separate it out. And we'll be able to see right here what they're actually meaning and, 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 and saying with it. So again, for experience, two to five projects. That details the experience, basically the scope, okay? Making making relations to um, the statement of work, the work that was being done, the scope, and then also magnitude, okay? You don't want, you know, if you're going after a million dollar job, you don't want to like use a $10,000 commercial contract you did. It's not going to be relevant. And then past performance, okay? For the projects that you submitted in the experience factor. So the same projects, like I was saying, but then they want you to include the contact information, Okay. Emails are good. Um, phone numbers, they'll usually ask for it though. And I think they've included attachments separately. So we'll, we'll see what they actually flesh out with this. And again, guys, um, last, last bit on this, cause this is stuff that's like lined up so perfectly for these things that I, I like to harp on a little bit because it's so, so important. And it's the things that you guys are always asking, Derek, what if I don't have past performance? Okay. So you see here, and this is written into the FAR, vendors without a record of past performance or if the record's not available, your quote will be evaluated, um, your quote will not be evaluated favorably or unfavorably. Instead, you will get a neutral rating. It won't hurt you or help you, okay? So you don't get put in the bad pile, but that doesn't mean people or companies that have, you know, doesn't mean you're necessarily going to be able to outdo them, but the government will look at your other factors that are being considered like your pricing or like, you know, what else they have here, your technical, which is going to include, include like your cleaning schedule and your Q, your QCP. This way, the government as written into the FAR is not keeping out small businesses that are new to federal contracting just because they can't play the whole chicken and the egg thing of, oh, I need a government contract, past performance to win a government contract. No, that's just not true. You get neutrally rated. I haven't really, you know, harped on that uh, recently, but um, yeah, so technical and past performance when combined again, are equal when compared to price. Okay, so price is 50%. And then some mix of technical and past performance is also going to be 50%. So maybe like 25, 25. They didn't say that, but maybe. And when you put it all together, it's going to be 100% rating. So questions, site visits, um, submission requirements, you know, I think we spent a lot of time on this, you know, instruction to submissions, super important here. Um, they're kind of just giving you the, the POC on that. And then here's the actual pricing cleanse, price per month extended out over a year. Then it's going to be five years. So there's your pricing cleanse. Um, really quickly, they gave us a quick quote sheet. So we'll see that. And then we'll jump into the chat. Um, I try not to spend too much on any one bid. But when I find good ones like this, um, I do tend to spend a little extra time. So this is the pricing sheet. Same thing that we just saw, month and extended price. Extremely intuitive to fill this out. This shouldn't give anybody nightmares if you're actually going after this one live. And then what was the other thing? Oh, the uh, vendor experience sheet. I wanted to show you guys really fast. I mean, I wanted to show myself. I haven't seen it yet either. So how many pages we got? Okay, five pages. So this is the experience. Okay, so this is name building square footage remember they're talking about the scope they're talking about uh you know even magnitude customer information name title okay poc it 
to me, this actually looks like a combination of the past experience and the past performance. Since the number one thing for the past performance was that referral information, and they're building that into this customer ID section. So I would just spend a bit more time, maybe ask the question of contracting saying, hey, um, is that like you want us to provide something different for each? Or is that attached experience sheet going to suffice for, for both? All right, cool. So I think that's enough on that one. Let's go ahead and see what we got going on here in the chat. <laughs> Let's see here. All right, cool. Uh, Demi Styles, I'm new here, everyone. Quick question. Uh, when the contracts are set for five years, how does the payment work? It depends on the contract. But if you're looking for like a five-year contract, that's a being called a five-year contract. That's probably more of a services-based contract. Most services are, are net 30 with the government. Um, net 60 to get set up though. And then once you're set up, it's going to be more of like, like a net 30. But it's, you know, if it's more of a project-based thing, then it could be like more milestone-based where it's not net 30. So to answer the question accurately, it really is um, depends on the context of what type of contract and really what the work is. Bob uh, Daldo, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. I have a question. I'm brand new to Gov Contracts. Came across via YouTube. Love it. Spent a week looking around, learning about contracts, and I came across an industry niche where I can earn 100% margins. So far, my life experience has shown me when things are too good to be true, they are, they are uh, not. Um, this is Not only is there an amazing margin, but some of the contracts go no bids. What am I missing? And sorry about the non-existent punctuation on my phone. Trying to understand the question, Bob. Um, so you're, you found a niche. The niche sounds great. You can get 100% margins in this industry, but you think it's too good to be true. And then the question is, some of the contracts go no bids. What am I missing? Um, I think I just need a, sorry, Bob. I just need a bit more context to, to fully answer that. What do you mean when you're saying most of the, or some of the contracts go no bids? If you want to expand on that, I can circle back around. Devon McLeod, is there a place where we can look at the full contract description of a contract that has already been awarded? If we get that from FPDS. Yeah, so Devonda, um, and welcome back. I definitely uh, recognize the, the name. So thanks for coming back here, Devonda. Um, FPDS, well, what you kind of see is what you get on FPDS. Uh, if you're saying like you want the actual like, a, like documents so you can go back, I think that's because that's like an intelligent question to ask, right? Um, okay, I see like the contract was this and it was awarded for this on this day to this company, et cetera. Now I want to go back and like look at the solicitation so that I can really compare and see what was being like, like what was awarded on and what was this pricing really based on since you only get like high level information um, and it's hard to use the pricing information if you don't have the full scope. Uh, the only way to get that information is um, if it's not still posted on SAM any longer, if it's been archived, um, you have to do a FOIA request. So Freedom of Inf Information Act. Um, I heard a couple of years ago that they changed the laws around that, that they don't even allow that anymore, or at least the information they're releasing. Because you used to be able to FOIA other people's proposals. And that's how you would end up getting like up to speed really, really quickly. It was an amazing strategy that I'm, I'm nearly hundred percent sure on that. They don't release that anymore, but um, I do still believe through a FOIA request that they would release the solicitation documents so that you could compare apples to apples with the information that you're finding on FPDS, but it is a process. There is that barrier and it's kind of up to you if you're wanting to invest that time. Awesome. More, do you have a run through of a proposal document? Yes, I do. Um, I definitely do. Uh, you know, we've got our shirt here, bid team. Um, that's all that type of stuff. Cause obviously it's too much to cover over on a YouTube channel or live session. Um, so feel free to check out govkidmethod.com if you want more information on, on that. SJ, can we see some bids with transportation or security? I think we have an electronic security one coming up. I'm doing homework. I wanted to see something else besides janitorial 25 bids just started. Um, what do you mean 25 bids? You've done 25 bids? Um, uh, sorry, what is the requirement? Um, so the one we just reviewed was for janitorial. When should I get into the coachable class halfway through the program or when I finish the program? 
Um, SJ, which program are you referring to? Are you talking about like our bidding bundle? Um, if you have questions about that, I highly recommend you shoot an email over to support at govkidmethod.com. That way you can talk to like, like a real human and we can have like a, a side, you know, a side conversation can be had on that. So just support at govkidmethod.com. I'll just put that in the chat. And um, it's probably the best course of action and next step for you on that. Perfect, perfect. Um, I'm also new. Is there a method for pricing bids? Um, yeah, Adrian and Alexander. Uh, so it's all going to be based off of like what you're going after. Um, typical industry competitive margins across the board are like 10 to 20%. But that's a gross range. Could be higher, could be lower, depending on your industry. But more than like your actual profit strategy and getting started is you're going to really need to learn how to be competitive in your industry. So say if you have an existing base business, Adrian, and you're like, okay, we were a roofing contractor, for example, and we've been doing this for ten years in the commercial space. You know, we're great. We got a crew. Now I want to expand my my book of business and start doing this for the government. Well, your pricing strategy will be the same to bring that over to government contracting. Okay. Um, especially for these small business contracts, the government will ask for like breakdowns and things like that, but there's not this whole other pricing thing to figure out. The government wants you to do like what you're doing for the commercial space, but do it for them. So it's not like a whole, like a whole different thing, but the government will give you, for example, um, pricing cleanse, pricing worksheets to follow, and that will be your guide. Um, to pricing it accurately and to presenting your pricing in a way that the government wants it price uh, presented. But to just say, you know, like, hey, you know, what is the pricing strategy for government contracting? Um, it's just very specific and it changes for each industry and each niche, uh, et cetera. So hopefully that makes sense. Is this for commercial items or service? Um, not sure. Want to answer the question, but I need more context what you're asking. Um, I'm Shante. I was in your Zoom class last week. When you gave the special price, I took advantage and I just jumped in the water naked. <laughs> awesome. Congrats. Uh, congrats, Shante. That's awesome. Um, so happy to have you uh, take advantage of that. And so, yeah, like I said, just email support at govkidmethod.com and we can kind of um, help answer some more of those questions that you have. But let's go. Congrats. That's awesome. Um, Paris, if you're the only company to bid, that doesn't necessarily mean you'll automatically win. True. Yeah, that's actually true. Um, if so, what does the government then go to a major corp? No. So like if you're the only company to bid, uh, the government would say potentially and very likely that it did not receive enough offers. There was not enough competition. So they're going to recompete out this bid. So they'll kill it. And, you know, because like if you're the only person and you're super high, they're not going to like overly pay. They're not obligated to do that. Instead, they'll kill the bid. They'll recompete it out so that they get something that is more competitive and attractive for what they're they're asking for. And yes, um, for example, if the route that they tried, this route that was unsuccessful, say it was set aside for small businesses or something like that, and this is the result, then when they go to actually like recompete this out, they may say like, screw it. Like we're not doing that again. We're gonna learn from our mistakes. Apparently there's not enough or sufficient small businesses interested in this. So instead we're just gonna open it up full and open competition. Um, where, you know, the big boys and, and anybody and everybody under the sun can bid on this. And then that's how they're going to achieve competition on contracts to get like their best, their best deal. So, so yeah, you're pretty um, spot on there. Uh, no contractor bids on the ability to perform the contract. I was wondering if that's a sign about it being a bad contract, especially since the contract falls under simplified acquisition. So no contractor bids on the ability to perform the contract. I'm wondering if that's a sign about it being a bad contract. Um, it sounds like you're saying nobody's bidding it. That could be a sign, but I, I guess I would be wondering how do you know nobody's bidding it? Um, yeah, I'm I'm still struggling a little bit to to understand it. Um, how do you find out? And just we'll we'll jump to the next bid for the interest of time, guys. Uh, how do you find out who's buying your products? Go to sam.gov. And every listing on there is a need. It's a problem the government needs solved. Go to sam.gov um, and start reading through that. And I always say spend an uncomfortable amount of time on Sam before even like trying to get registered or anything like that. That way, you know, you have a proof of concept, a viable business model to actually build your GovCon business off of instead of assuming the government's buying 
what you want to sell. And then you jump through all these hoops, you get registered in Sam. And then a couple months later, you're like, I can't find it. Like I can't find anything. Well, you should have found it first. So um, I give that advice out a lot. All right, cool guys. I'm just going to bounce back to our next bid. Love the engagement. And hey, if you are getting a lot of value from today, hit that like button, smash the like button. If you're live, if you're here right now, if you've asked a question, hit the like button. Let me know that you're, you're liking this. And then um, I will pick back up where we left off with the questions and comments for the interest of time after we get through this next bid, which is for document shredding. Seems pretty straightforward, very intuitive. This is actually due today as well. So let's be more of a, an example than a practical bid. October 26, small business set aside, 561990 NAICS code, Corpus Christi out of Texas. We have two attachments to solicitation and what appears to be maybe, oh, okay. So we have a solicitation down here and then the Q&A doc up here. So the nomenclatures and the way they name these documents, like it's a person doing it, it's a human. So this is another thing that contributes to every bid being different. So, okay, we're good. Let's go ahead and look at our solicitation to start with. All right. All right, so 56 pages, Just kicking off with our SF1449 form. Again, this is for document shredding services. We're hit with our pricing cleanse. Number one, document shredding. This is 275,000 and the unit is in pounds. So quarter million pounds. And this will be for the Corpus Christi Army, Army Depot. And then there's going to be, this is looking like an option because it's, going from 1001 from 0001, but I'm not seeing dates or years. So that's something that I'm gonna be looking for, but what appears to be option year two. And yes, now we're seeing the dates and the actual delivery schedule broken out. So this will kick off December 3rd, go for a full year. And then there'll be two option years to extend this through uh, 2025 to do about a quarter million pounds of document shedding, shredding per year. We have some uh, representations. We do see the evaluation here and it's quick. It's very easy to miss this sometimes. It's, um, guys, I just checked. We've got 39 people joining us live. Can we just like celebrate that? That's awesome. I think that's like one of the all time highs. Uh, so kudos to all of you live right now. And again, 39 of us, like let's smash that like button. Let's try and get 39 likes on the video. That's awesome. Uh, so again, evaluation here. They're going to say lowest price. Okay, lowest price on this bid. But you must know anytime you're doing lowest price bids, that doesn't mean lowest price wins. It means lowest price technically acceptable wins. It means you have to still be a good fit first. Okay. And then your price has to be the lowest. But that's all they're saying for evaluation. Then we have more reps and certs. Then we're hit with our statement of work. Okay, this is document shredding. It's not, this is not that complicated. This is very intuitive. And this is a, again, a small business set aside, right? So could you arguably contact a document shredding company that's near, you know, Corpus Christi and have them do this? Well, yes, you can. Why? Because you're a small business, arguably, they have to be a small business. So if they're a similarly situated entity, then you can do your legal middlemaning, right? Or if this is below a simplified acquisition, which we don't know, but if it is, limitations on subcontracting don't apply either. So there's almost like a two-fold overkill of you being able to 100% legally middleman a contract like this. And that's how a lot of you like to start out. That's why I, I'm like, Guys, I, I get on calls with a number of you and um, I'm like, hey, what's what size of contract do you want to win? Like 10,000, 20,000. I'm like, really? Why? Simplified acquisition is 250K. You know what I'm saying? Like we, we need to think bigger. And, and contracts like this are definitely a lot bigger than 10 and 20K. And this, this is not, I am the least get rich quick guy that exists on YouTube and in the space. Okay. It's a long-term game. It takes time. 
but that does not mean you have to go so low that you're not going to like make any money either. Like I'm, I'm a, I'm a realist, like, okay, realistically, like let's do, I mean, if you're really working it, let's do a few hundred K in profit. Okay. For your first year, like let's, if you're really working it or if, if you're like somewhat working it, you know, let's do like six figures in profit. Like that's, that's not get rich quick. That's realistic. And then your year two will probably be like way better than your year one. And then you start getting into some cool, some cool numbers and stuff like that. Okay. So that's our solicitation. And I just want to take a glance. Um, they didn't really give us a whole lot there. So let's see what they have for the Q and a. Now this is an indication of how many bidders and how much interested parties there are sometimes. Okay, we have 25 questions. I don't think that's coming from the same company. Okay, so I think we have at least a few companies interested in this. I'm not going to go through each one of these, but you always want to go through each all of these if it's something that you're serious about bidding because you can find gold nuggets in here all day long, questions you didn't think to ask, or just clarifications that you didn't know that you needed clarified. And you're like, man, I'm glad that I saw that. Okay. Yeah. These are all great questions. Actually, they're very specific. I'm trying to find ones that would be, you know, relevant to us. How will the work performance be assessed? Okay. They're going to assess your work through the CPAR system. A lot of people will have questions like, Hey Derek, how do I get, how do I get in CPAR? So you got to do work for the government. What is the payment process? It's going to be through WAF, which is wide area workflow. Okay. It's, it takes like 30 days to get set up on there. It is a bit of a process. You know, I have, I have clients that have recently won contracts and they're like, Derek, this is a little bit like lengthy to go through. Like, yes, it is. That's why I always say the first chug is a net 60 because you got that net 30, but then you got a plus another 30 days to get set up in WAF. So you need to plan for that up front. Like if you can. Do we need to provide new uh, to, <laughs> size of bins? Do we need to provide new ones? Uh, the company will provide company bins. So you got to provide your own bins. Okay. So make sure you're reading through that. I'm just going to do one quick browse since kind of was soapboxing a lot as I went through this. We see price inclines. We see lowest price. We see a statement of work. And then a wage determination. We saw our evaluation factors. There are no, yeah, there are no instruction offers, proposal formatting, things like that. So this is going to be more of like a, a true quote based as well. All right. Let me just kind of try to pick up where we left off. Um, imperfect fits with payment contracts. There is a lot of steps. Um, you tell me, I mean, I, I can't be an expert of every industry. But uh, there's steps that are unique to industries, I will tell you. And then there are steps that are like universal. You know, every bit is different, but we cover those overlaps here on these shows and on the channel. Um, Devana says, when do you have Zoom calls? I wanted this special price. So yeah, we have the bidding bundle, but then we actually have the coaching program. Devana, they're two different offerings. And um, yeah, if you have questions or you want, like, like I said, to talk to a human about that, I said that to SJ as well. If you want to talk to human about that, um, just email support at govkidmethod.com and we can have a, like a side conversation about that. Um, reaching higher, what is the process of bidding on local and state contracts? Um, I So I don't touch uh, city, state, local, county. I don't do anything with them. Never have, never will, um, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, so I've been told by like clients that I've worked with who do double dip and do both. The processes are similar, but each each jurisdiction, like city jurisdiction or county or state, um, they do have their own unique things. But here on the channel, we only do federal contracts. We only do SAM.gov. So that's all that I will say. Paris is saying, got it. Uh, that's exactly what I was referring to. Perfect. 100%. Robin Wilson, how do I find micro bids in my area? Hey, that's a great question. Um, You don't. And that's the problem. A lot of people want to get started. Hey, I'm going to do micro purchase. Or I, you know, somebody said, I heard somebody say, Hey man, don't worry about doing proposal writing. Like that's for, you know, next level stuff. If you want to get started, just do credit cards and micro purchases. Well, I have that same question. Okay. How, how do you go about finding those? 
Okay, I've done them, but I didn't find them. So how did I do those? I did those through relationships. You don't have relationships. This is why we focus on bidding on sam.gov and we are marketing indirectly. We don't market directly, but by way of bidding in a targeted way through offices and agencies, demonstrating to contracting that we are getting in the game. We are responding to what they're asking for. We're being, we're keeping it professional instead of keeping it like scammy. You develop relationships with contracting over time. And over time, you may find yourself with opportunities to do credit card purchases, micro purchases. Um, but yeah, for those of you who say that's your strat, um, I, I, say, I say good luck. Like, because honestly, I'm teaching you the best way. The best way is to learn how to bid on SAM if you want to do federal work. Um, so yeah, that's kind of like my two cents. And it's a great question, Robin. It is a great question and it gets asked a lot. Um, Austin, how do you know when a contract can be middleman? Uh, so Austin, I have a great uh, middleman masterclass right now. It's totally free. Um, if you just go to govkidmethod.com. Actually, I'll just pull the link and I'll paste it because I know like we constantly have new people coming into the space. Some of you have taken the masterclass, but others haven't. It's totally free if you want to check it out. It's an hour long of going into the regulations and exactly what you asked. Austin, how do I know when I can do a legal middleman? Um, that's exactly what you will be able to walk away with after going through that. Um, it's a great question. Paris, will the government ask or require certain insurance for your business? Yeah, so typically like um, the, the general like liability insurance is something at a minimum that you're going to want to have when performing on a government contract. If the government hasn't stated um, more specific type of insurances, you'll at a minimum be needing to have that. And just your general like insurance agency will be able to provide that to you. And I mean, you can put that policy in effect like once you win the contract. You don't have to incur like too much overhead before you even have revenue coming in. If you're somebody who's like new and you don't have an existing business already. But yeah, you want to do that just to protect yourself anyways. Paris says the free masterclass was very good and informative, by the way. Hey, awesome. Um, that's actually really cool to hear. Uh, we have gotten a lot of amazing feedback on that. Thanks for sharing that uh, with us live, Paris. And I'm glad that uh, it was very helpful for you. Um, I know there's a lot of information out there, so it's really important to, to get it correct. You don't want to like use misinformation or I don't want to say there's misinformation, although like there is some, but that's not my business to tell you. My business is just to tell you like how to do it like the right way. So awesome. So let's do one more bid and I think we'll go ahead and then call it just for the interest of time. Um, Electronic security services. I know we had somebody asking for security stuff. So if that person is still around, maybe this would be a fit for you. Okay, let's see, we good? Okay, perfect. So this is due November 7th, small business set aside. 561-621 security systems services, uh, Fort Bragg, North Carolina. And we just have, funnily enough, a PWS only. Julius Blue and Tracy Brooks in contracting. And again, this is going to be for MIC, so the Mission and Installation Contracting Command. That's how you know it's the Army. It's also Fort Bragg. And again, this is due in about two weeks, November 7th. So this is a live bid, something you could actually go after. And when I saw that there was only one attachment on this, I thought it would be a great learning opportunity for you all. And we'll, we'll finish with this today because it's like, well, what do you do? <laughs> like, there's no solicitation. There's no SF 1449 form. There's no like regulation, like regulations, reps and certs. Uh, there's like nothing. There's just like work. So like, what do you do? Um, so Womack Army Medical Center, alarm security system. It's a non-personal services contract. So I'm thinking of a security system. I'm wondering, is this install? Is this install and maintenance? Or is this just like providing bodies to like monitor the system? Because I've seen both. Yeah, so they're saying they need alarm monitoring 24 seven. Okay, and they're saying non-personal services, which actually makes me think people. 
and they're giving us four addresses again because there's four off post buildings so think four buildings these four different addresses we could literally look those up in north carolina we can look that up on google maps they need 24 7 alarm monitoring And since it's 24 seven, if that means providing like manpower 24 seven, then you're going to be looking at, you know, two or three shifts per day. And then we're going to need to know, like, you know, how many days it's 24 seven. So is it, you know, I guess that is seven days a week. <laughs> That's what 24 seven means, isn't it? Yep. Um, holidays, hours. Yeah, so they are literally giving us nothing, like absolutely nothing to go off. Like nothing, like this is this is not quotable. I will go as far to say this is impossible for anybody to quote. Contracting needs to give us something. When we don't even have pricing, we don't even have structure to base pricing off of this is an example of something that is not quotable if this is something you're interested in i would email contracting submit an rfi just send an email saying we you know you need to identify what it is that you're you're needing to quote this but you could just say you know industry needs more information to quote this and then bullet like what are the things okay like are you needing a site visit to, to view the grounds um, are you needing like maps? Okay, that's not even a big deal. But in terms of like the schedule and the manpower, how how many people, you know, is it, you know, how many shifts are currently being performed? I doubt that this is not already being done. I do think there's an incumbent contractor. I try to not play the conspiracy theorist card, but I just do want to let you guys know that it does exist sometimes where contracting makes contracts so impossible to quote so that they can keep the same incumbent and they could be like, Oh, okay. Well, like we resolicited it and the, the, the quotes were not good. So we're going to stick with the same company. Well, why were the quotes not good? Because they failed to actually provide a true opportunity for small businesses as this is set aside for, to respond to this. So we need to dig on our heels. If this is something we're interested in and like demand, not demand, but like we, we need it before we could even, consider seriously responding to this. Um, I suspected that might be the case, which is why I wanted to pull it because I saw there was only one attachment and the attachment was not the solicitation because that's fine. But when we don't even have the solicitation doc, we have nothing to go off of except for PWS. It's not quotable. So I just wanted to give you guys that vote of confidence, show you an opportunity. If you ever experience this on your own, this is what you need to do. You know, you write an email of contracting, you let them know you need more information to quote it. And it's not just you, it's, it's industry. Like industry is not able to um, help, help them out. It's like, you know, help me help you sort of thing is what your, your tone kind of can be with contracting on this. Okie dokie. Okay. So Al, um, is it Al or I, AI, um, digest isn't having a staffing company basically being middleman. No, it's not because when you're staffing, um, those employees are employees of your company. Like, like you're, they're staffed through your company versus like quote unquote, doing something like a middleman, you're working with a subcontractor. Okay. So you're, you're speaking about W2 employees versus subcontractors. So it's not the same thing. Is it imperative to have certifications? Um, no, it's not. I always say that it's not. Uh, most of the solicitations we look at here live on the channel by design, our small business set aside or their total small business set aside. Now, how do you become a total small business set aside so that you can bid on these contracts, right? Well, there's nothing you have to do. It is the one set aside that you automatically get. All you have to do is register and Sam back up, get your cage code, um, get all your ducks in a row with Sam. And then once that, once you're finished with that, you're kind of like let off the leash. Okay. You're automatically a total small business. As long as you don't have an established business that has revenue and excessive, or in excess of the size standards with NAICS codes, which are going to be in the um, the multiple millions or multiple uh, multiple millions. 
So like five to 10 million or 10 to 20 million, 20 to 30 million. These are the ranges where um, based on particular NAICS codes and size standards that small businesses are no longer considered small businesses. But for most of you, your businesses are very small and are under those thresholds. Feel free to check those out. You can just go to Google, type SBA NAICS code. It'll pull up a 50 page table of all the, the NAICS codes and their size standards. And if, if you're like, hey, we're doing a couple million, I wanna check this out, cool. Most of you are not doing a couple million. Um, so that means you have to do absolutely nothing. You're automatically total small business. And then you can go after these small business set-asides and you don't have to go over that hurdle of getting any certifications. And that's my best advice as a place to start. Devana says, if nothing is written, the original set aside, which one applies? Do we seem, assume it's full competition? Yeah, it's 50-50. It could be full and open, um, but just make sure you actually read the solicitation itself because the SAM backup listing page could be blank, but if you actually go into the solicitation, um, it may say like it, there's boxes that could be checked on the SF1449 form. So just make sure it's not like 8A or VOSB or hub zone or something like that. Can you ask for a contract to be a specific set aside if there isn't one? So that you're getting into responding to source of sought notices. The purpose of responding to source of sought notices is you can influence the set aside. Um, we don't really get into that. Instead, we just focus on, on finding the solicitations that are our set aside um, and going after those because responding to source of sorts, unless you're an 8A, cannot win you contracts. So it's like first things first. Um, then if you want to add this, you know, influencing strategy to your existing strategy, but it's like, you know, you don't want to start taking protein shakes and supplements if you're not even eating a good diet first, right? So you have to have your core stuff in place first, which is bidding on contracts, on, you know, contracts that are a close match for your business and that are within your set aside. And then if you want to expand that and start trying to influence source of thoughts, you could respond to those um, as a supplement to your business. But the problem is too many focus on doing that because it gets them out of having to like learn how to do the bidding and proposal writing process, which is what we teach. And then they never get around to winning contracts. So if you want to win, you want to work backwards from the closest thing you could do from winning, which is like bidding on the actual contract, putting your hat in the ring. Now, if you got that going, you can back forward a little bit more and then you can open up your range a little bit to include the source of salt responses. But it's why I don't talk about it here on the channel um, because too many people get that confused. And I'd rather have a clear message so that you know exactly what you need to do and exactly what you don't need to focus on right now. Um, uh, Kay Daniel Deco, hey, GovKid, uh, first time watching, awesome. Uh, for projects in different states, do you need to open a business in those states? No, you don't. Um, whatever your business is registered in, is fine, uh, whatever state that is. For federal contracting, um, you can do business in all 50 states. You may run across contracts saying, hey, there needs to be some sort of geographic like presence, geographic radius, 300 miles, 200 miles, at which point in time, like if you're working with a subcontractor or something like that, you will wanna find somebody who is within that range. Ray T, so glad to, fi to find a live stream. Yeah, um, it it's something that doesn't exist a whole lot. So we're, we're super happy to, to do it as well, Ray. Um, new to the Gov Contracts idea, notifications will be turned on now. Awesome. Thanks for um, joining the channel. And again, guys, if you are new here, consider subscribing. This way you can ask your questions on future live streams. And if you hung out with us today, um, definitely, definitely smash that like button. Man, we got 45 people hanging out with us today. Um, about 38 was a, a lot from earlier. But yeah, like let's even get 45 likes on the video just so we can all like say that we were here and we did this cool thing today. <laughs> Um, yeah, it's pretty awesome. That's why I like doing the lives because the community th thing is, is so, so important to me. And I don't, I think there's such a restriction to access uh, of information out there. Um, so we try to do a, a good job to help fill that need in the space. Um, and obviously there's so much more to learn, uh, guys that we do here on the channel, um, to actually start bidding and winning. What we do on these lives is really just drop in the ocean. Again, it was alluded to a couple of questions about it today, but if you are looking for a step-by-step -step proven process, okay, to follow with the weekly coaching that we offer um, inside of our bid team, we got our bid team t-shirts because we are a team. Um, this way you can make sure you're doing this stuff right. If you think you may be the next perfect fit to join our bid team, um, you definitely want to uh, check out how you can apply and book a call on my website, govkidmethod.com. And that way you can uh, actually speak to a real human um, instead of all of this crazy internet stuff. 
so yeah, check that out if you're interested. And thanks for hanging out with us today, guys. Um, we may or may not do another live this week. Um, if not, we will definitely be back next week, but I'll try to squeeze in one more this week. So if you got your notifications on, make sure you keep an eye out for that. Um, thank you everybody for the questions and the engagement, and we will see you all in the next live session. Take care.